Uh, welcome back. I'm Michael Keegan with the Coalition for Nuclear Free Great Lakes. And it is my honor to uh, present uh, Dr. Arjun Makajani will be presenting the way forward without nukes. Yes, indeed. Arjun Makajani is president of the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research in Tacoma Park, Maryland, with a PhD specializing in nuclear fission, fusion, I'm sorry, nuclear fusion. Uh, Dr. Makajani is a recognized authority on energy issues. Since 1971, he has published numerous articles, reports, and books on energy and the environment, including carbon-free and nuclear-free, a roadmap for U.S. energy policy, uh, that was in 2007. Dr. Makajani has testified before Congress and served as a consultant to several state utilities and UN agencies. Dr. Bakajani is also known as Dr. Egghead in his uh, monthly uh, pamphlet and some tremendous question and answers back and forth. Um, so uh, he'll be presenting for about 45 minutes and then he'll do a question and answer for about 20 minutes. And then at 5 to 12, I'm going to have some announcements. Without any further ado, Dr. Arjun Makajani. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, being in a famous university um, reminds me of the time I was a student in the University of Bombay, and uh, I wanted to come here for graduate school, and I applied to many famous places. I don't think I applied to the University of Chicago. Was it not famous in 1960? No, sorry. <laughs> uh, no, I didn't know about that reactor when I was applying to graduate school. Uh, and then I thought it'd be nice to go to school in the capital of the United States. And I applied to Washington State University. <laughs> and they gave me this wonderful assistantship. And I said yes. And I found I was 3,000 miles off. <laughs> and anyway, I went. It was good. And then I did my doctorate in California. Uh, and that was even better. Um, how many of you recognize the guy on the left, on, on your left? Oh, this is a very good audience, more than average. Um, David Freeman, father of energy policy in this country, in my opinion. Uh, five years ago, he made a speech at a conference. You recognize the woman on the right, yes. Helen Caldicott. And uh, Helen had a conference on energy in 2006, about six and a half years ago. And Dave and I were both speaking there, and Dave made a speech in which he said we should get rid of nuclear, and we should get rid of coal, and we should get rid of oil, and go to solar. So in 2006, and solar was about $8 a watt at that time. It was very expensive. And I went up to him and I said, you're going to send every industry we have left to China. You know, this is not a, you haven't said something that sounds sensible to me. And he said, uh, well, don't be a, well, he uses more salty language than I do. <laughs> and um, anyway, he said, don't be a naysayer. You haven't done the technical study. Um, and it's true that I've been working on nuclear disarmament for many years and, and the pollution caused by nuclear weapons production and some on energy, but since the mid 80s, I hadn't done a whole lot of work on energy. And Helen said, you know, the planet is in intensive care, and I'll show you only one slide about that. Uh, this is the most important thing that we could be working on. You, if you do the study, I'll raise the money. And this is, of course, an offer that no one who runs a nonprofit can refuse. <laughs> and so I said, okay, but I don't promise you a positive answer that it's possible to do this in a reasonable time and reasonable cost. You know, if you have unlimited money, you can do it, but and so I went into doing this book, Carbon Free, Nuclear Free, uh, and the title really did come after I finished my research. Uh, I didn't start with this idea. I started only to look at whether it was feasible technically with the technologies that 
either we had in hand or that technology that we had in hand whose costs we could see reasonably in the next 10 years. So this isn't predicting what will happen, which I hope will be more efficient and better than what I calculated, but I concluded at the end of a year's research that, to my own surprise, that you could actually get rid of fossil fuels, not just in the electricity sector, but from the whole energy sector, if we were only willing to have some guts and be sensible. And tomorrow, tomorrow you will hear uh, the German story about that, uh, which is, I think, going to be probably the first major country to make that come true. But when I wrote this, this was kind of sticking my neck pretty far out uh, in 2007. So we don't have one energy problem. We have four energy problems. Well, we used to have three until Washington got involved. <laughs> and now we have four. Uh, so we have, of course, the climate problem. Then we have the oil and war problem, or the oil insecurity problem. The 20th century has really been, to a large extent, a century of war for oil, uh, one side of it anyway. Then we've got the nuclear insecurity problem and all the water problems and other things that go with it. And now, you know, since Washington got involved with the food and corn into ethanol mandates, now we've got a food problem associated with the, supposedly with renewable energy, which is not a very sensible way to do biofuels. There is a sensible way to do biofuels. I won't talk about it. Uh, so this chart is from 2007, when there was the first big surprise of Arctic ice melting in the summer. The red line there, red, this red line, is the median projection in the model. So you know you have to give the right wing credit for being right about one thing. When they are skeptical about the climate models, they are right but they're not skeptical in the right way. The, actually, uh, the models are incomplete and imperfect, and the modelers will tell you that, but most, most of the things, or many of the things are, that are not in the models actually would indicate a worse outcome, unfortunately. And so this, oh, sorry. So this thing, was the measurement. So you see a sudden fallout. This is the threshold effect. This is your climate cliff. Now, instead of the median of complete summer melting being somewhere way out there in the 21st century where we don't necessarily want to think about it, it is now maybe 2015, next year, 2020, 2000. Okay, we don't know, but it's much sooner probably. Uh, and now this is pretty widely acknowledged, which was not acknowledged by many at the time. So we've got a climate cliff to worry about more than a fiscal cliff. Okay, so nuclear, you know, all, all energy sources, you know, you produce solar panels, you're going to have some carbon dioxide pollution. You produce nuclear, you're going to have some. You produce wind turbines, you're going to have some. In, a, in an economy where you have coal, you're going to have some, you're going to have some carbon pollution from anything. But if you get rid of the fossil fuels, uh, you know, nuclear is a, is a low CO2 source of energy. Uh, so is solar and so is wind. We're not lacking low CO2 sources of energy. We're lacking time and we're lacking money. And nuclear is bad for both. So I'll tell you a little story from, from Texas. In, in 2000, and so, so we've had this too cheap to meter and then a hangover from the too cheap to meter, which is really a come on story. Not quite, I'll sell you the Brooklyn Bridge. But at least if you bought the Brooklyn Bridge, the bridge is there. There've been more than 100 nuclear power plants that the public paid for that never got finished, that never generated any electricity. Now, in Texas, they announced that the South Texas two new reactors would be six, seven billion dollars. Two reactors, six, seven billion dollars. 
And so some groups hired me to say, well, what do you think the cost is going to be? And I said, oh, I think it's going to be between 12 and 17 billion. And I had a press conference about, about it in front of City Hall. And the utility, which is a municipal utility, wouldn't tell us at the time what they were willing to pay for their 50% share. And then slowly the truth started creeping out and they said 13 billion and then, you know, that already it was a scandal and I was looking very golden there. 13 billion was well within my range. And then it turns out there'd been a little bit of a kind of, did somebody say cover up? Anyway, there'd been some attempt to hide the actual price. And then they said 18 billion. Now the project I think is pretty much dead, close to dead. There's not going to be a nuclear renaissance, fortunately, I believe. The cost is at the center of it. So seven to $10,000 a kilowatt. The GE CEO, Jeffrey Immelt said in 2007 that if he were the CEO of a utility, he was asking for nuclear subsidies. Now he makes nuclear, he makes gas turbines, he makes wind turbines, that he would do wind and, or gas, he would not do nuclear. So, you know, part of the nuclear enterprise is to be takers and to go to the government and say, give me money and then I'll do nuclear. And very often they can't, then, even then they can't do it. Or they go to the ratepayers, or both. He said it's a bet the company risk. Progress Energy has a project in Florida whose current cost estimate is $24 billion for two reactors. That's about, you know, over $10,000 a kilowatt or, or thereabouts. It's the upper end of, end of that range. And they're collecting money from ratepayers. I don't think they're ever going to build it, but they're not obligated to give back the money if they don't build it. That's the law in Florida. Now, ex, the CEO of Exelon said, you know, gas, gas basically, to paraphrase that gas, natural gas is going to kill nuclear. No price on carbon. So besides cost, what is the problem with nuclear? That, oh, got a finger too thick. These are centrifuges. That's the kind of... Uh, plant in Iran that is causing global concerns about proliferation. Uh, but we built one in New Mexico. Did, did you know that a, a centrifuge uranium enrichment plant was started in New Mexico in the last few years? Many of us here tried to stop it, uh, but we did not succeed. They, we would have to build three plants like this, two to three plants like this every year, somewhere in the world, if we tried to solve even part of the global CO2 issue with nuclear. That's, of course, Kristen already showed you the plutonium button. This is a different picture of the same thing. Uh, you make 90,000 bombs worth of plutonium in nuclear reactors every year. If you tried to solve maybe 40, 50 percent of the electricity generation problem to displace coal with nuclear. Not a very good, listen. All a nuclear reactor is, it's a boiler. It doesn't do anything high tech. It just boils water. We're making plutonium to just, just to boil water. Some people might say, duh. Okay. Now you can boil a lot of water in one tank with not much uranium, but we're still making plutonium just to boil water. And if that is the limit of our technological innovation, we have to call on extraterritorial powers to help us. And then there's the proliferation connection. The creators of the nuclear enterprise knew this. Oppenheimer said that he would hide the nuclear weapons enterprise in a nuclear power enterprise if he had to go for a nuclear weapons convention because other people may cheat, you know. I think Native Americans know very well that the United States never cheats and on treaties. And um, the Saudi foreign minister made a very interesting statement in 2006 in, in which he said, what, me, bombs? No, really, it's, we, we, we have a problem with Israel having bombs and we have a problem with Iran that may have bombs, but we're gonna do it in the open. 
and we're not going to. But we call on Israel to renounce nuclear weapons, and uh, but we're going to build nuclear reactors, even though we have a lot of oil and we have more solar energy than we could know. And he didn't say that. El Baradai also said that the rush to nuclear power is a lot about getting de facto deterrence. Okay. So these are, you've heard, you're going to hear a lot about the various waste problems. I won't go into it. I, I want to say a word about France because everybody said, we have to be like France. They, they do 75% nuclear. And they extract the plutonium for uh, recycling. And some people even say that they use nine, reuse 90 to 95%. That statement is wrong. It only contains, the French only use about, reuse about 1% of their spent fuel. And they have a surplus stock of plutonium sitting there at La Hague on the Normandy Peninsula. Worldwide, we have enough surplus plutonium. We have enough surplus, it's the same amount of surplus plutonium in the civilian sector as there is in all the nuclear weapons, in all the nuclear weapon states put together mainly Russia and the United States, of course. The French have polluted the oceans all the way to the Arctic from their reprocessing. The British, of course, you know, they pollute the English Channel and the British pollute the Irish Sea, so it's all okay. And now I, I have to tell you, this is, I'm not anti-French. I'm very pro-French. I love the French. I sleep with one of them every day. The same one. <laughs> And, and uh, I love French food, I love French trains, their health system is very wonderful, we could learn a lesson or two. But this, they did under duress and they really, right now, they're worrying after Fukushima, what if we have that here? What's gonna to happen to the Bordeaux? What's gonna to happen to the wonderful cheese? What's gonna to happen to our great gastronomic traditions? And it's a beautiful country. Those of you who haven't been there should go. Uh, that I, uh, let's see, what happened here? Oh, how did I get rid of that? Okay. okay, this was Fukushima before, this is Fukushima after, I won't dwell on this. The reason to show you Fukushima, the one point I want to make is in the last few years it's become very clear, you know, you hear a nuclear is base load and that's why we should do it. But nuclear is base load until it's not. It's 24-7 until it's zero over 365. So now Japan's 53 out of 54 reactors are shut. So they are, nuclear is zero over 365. It doesn't matter why they are shut. It's a, it's a technology that for a host of reasons, more than a handful, that can go overnight in an unpredictable way so you can have an accident and it'll blow up on you. Of course, that one's done. But then all the other ones were done too. Now that won't happen to a natural gas-fired power plant or a solar, you know, we had a wind turbine blow off a blade somewhere in the Midwest last year. Just the most catastrophic thing that can happen to a wind turbine. And fortunately, these things are a little bit out and isolated. Nobody got hurt or killed. And that was it. One and a half megawatts gone, which is, you know, a little more than one in one million. One, one, we have one million megawatts of power in the US electricity grid. So one and a half megawatts, nobody noticed it. Nobody died. It was a little bit of economic damage. And all the other wind turbines didn't get shut down. We didn't say, oh, well, you know, we're worried that all the other, you know, we're going to have wind turbine blades raining down on us. And so we just shut them all down. We didn't do that. That happens with nuclear power plants. Well, Germany, you know, decided to accelerate their nuclear phase out. Uh, so eight were shut down over there. We've got, you know, several nuclear power plants shut down over here for various reasons. Uh, we had an earthquake in Virginia last year, and that shut down for a couple of months suddenly. So it can go, this thing is not, I must be doing something wrong. You'll hear tomorrow about how um, the costs of solar have evolved, but solar, I think, is going to, is already on a large scale kilowatt for kilowatt cheaper. It's intermittent, so it's not directly comparable. But baseload wind, wind plus storage, is cheaper and less risky, or at best at the cheapest end of nuclear costs that are projected. 
uh, comparable to nuclear. And baseload wind is a term that, you know, not, I didn't invent. Baseload wind is something that the National Renewable Energy Lab talks about. So let's talk about boiling, making plutonium to boil water isn't sensible. Make, using a lot of water to make electricity is not sensible to the place where we're headed. So we should try to get out of the thermal mode, which means we should try mainly to get out of coal and nuclear. Uh, to have a more secure grid, we also need a distributed grid. But the first thing we need is efficiency. So this is your average house, nearly 60,000 BTU per square foot. This is Hanover House in New Hampshire. Not fancy, not expensive, but well built, thoughtfully built. So the most important thoughtful thing you need to do when you build a house is to know where south is in the northern hemisphere. <laughs> and then you build it tight. This thing has no solar photovoltaic panels. It has solar thermal water heaters and a very large tank. It's heated by solar thermal heat and has efficient appliances and uses, has only 15% of the energy footprint of a normal house. Same in the commercial sector. This is all very economical. This house costs in today's dollars about $150 a square foot to build. And it's got lots of custom features because it was built by the guy that cared a lot about where he lived. Now, why don't we have houses that are built normally that are this efficient? This building actually could use efficiency improvements. University of Chicago, please seriously revamp your heating system. Thank you. Uh, and I'm not one to complain easily, but please. Uh, I give you free uh, consulting advice. If you pay my way, I'll come and spend a day. And uh, anyway, this, builders don't build efficient houses because there's no percentage in it for them. It has to be regulated. Apologies to Milton Friedman. Uh, because they, they're selling you the beautiful azaleas, they're selling you the beautiful windows, they're selling you the granite counters, out of which you could get radon, but most people don't know that. And you go in, you know, how did I buy the house I live in? You know, we walked in, there was light, it was a beautiful kitchen, it was a kind of house, you know, there was space to arrange and put all the members of the family that we hoped to accommodate in there, and we loved it, and we said, yeah, that one. And then we found it was very inefficient and we we're spending a lot of time, you know, fixing it up. The builder selling you that, yeah, I really want this place, this is where, and that's the way it should be. You want to buy a house or rent a house that's a living space for you for how you want to live. It should come efficient. For that, in order to level the playing field, so Regulations are about leveling the playing field for the public sector or the private sector. We need appliance and building regulations, and I will show you why. So this is the potential for appliance efficiency in the residential sector calculated by the American Physical Society. And you can see this is, the, this, this is a few years old, so there's a little bit obsolete cost. Now it's about 10 or 11 cents of residential electricity, all these things are a lot cheaper. The average cost of doing all of these things together, even the most expensive ones and the cheapest ones, is about right there. So one third the cost of, why aren't we doing this? Is because the market won't give this to us by ourselves. And the reason we actually have efficient appliances are because we do have regulations, and I'll show you. So this is what happened in the last 30, 40 years since the first energy crisis. Three appliances, gas furnaces, the black arrows are national standards and state standards. So state standards went into effect. Now, one, what is the political message anybody gets from this chart? Is there a political message here? There is a technical message, obviously. Anybody know what that is? Sorry? You need standards. No, that's the economic message. What's the political message? 
Okay, so you have to look at the color of the arrows. States came first. The federal government is a follower, right? So that's the lesson of US history that this immigrant has to give you, is the US government is the follower. In good and bad things, states come first. So make sure the state where you lo uh, live is first in the good things and not in the bad things. So I'll talk about refrigerators. So this is the history of refrigerator standards. When I first started working on energy, not in 1947, uh, the 1970 there, I started working on energy about then. Refrigerators were 100 kilowatt hours per cubic foot per year. And you can see this is, this is the cost of refrigerators. Uh, let's see, which one is it? This is the cost of refrigerator. They cost, a frost-free refrigerator cost about that much. So you can see the efficiency went up. So now the energy consumption is only 20 to 25% of what it was back then. 75% of the energy consumption is gone. And I actually wrote a letter to Milton Friedman asking him to comment on my review of his book, Capitalism and Freedom. Maybe his heirs here in the intellectual heirs in the university will, will do that. I'll, if I find out who that is, I'll send it to them. But he did not respond to me. He sent me a letter saying he wasn't interested. Uh, but uh, you can see that with regulations, not only we got more efficiency, it became cheaper. Thank you. So government is always present in the marketplace. You know, government makes the money that is the blood of the capitalist economy or any complex economy. All right, this is, so between Germany and the Pentagon, we may actually get somewhere. So this is a solar panel in the Navy base that was built in uh, 2000, this dates from 2002. This would um, be sufficient for 250 houses of the Hanover House efficiency. So if you build houses to that efficiency, but that one doesn't have air conditioning, so that's a little bit, uh, so not quite 250, maybe 100, 150 houses. All right, so this is a sunshine on a bright day, but you know, days aren't always bright. So people tell me, don't, so what are you going to do when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine? Well, I know, before I finished my book, I knew that the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't shine, and you may get, you know, nights that are very still. And of course, by definition, the sun doesn't shine at night. By definition, I know that. So, so this is the ideal insulation curve, but um, I haven't learned how to download my, so I have solar on my house, and I, I, tr I can track each panel all the time, every half hour, and I, I have to learn how to sh put those, put that little movie into my slideshow. I, ha I haven't done that yet. Uh, but when cloud spot, you can lose most of your generation in a very short period of time. It's a problem that you have to deal with. Also, I won't go into, I'll, I'll illustrate this with pictures, but there are a dozen ways to deal with that problem. First of all, when you put wind and solar together, so very often you have wind at night, so you have a, compl you have a complementary situation. So this is one, so you might need energy storage. First of all, you don't need energy storage where we are today. Until you reach 20, 25 percent, where Germany is now, or where Denmark is now, Texas sort of approaching. Did you know Texas was the leader in renewable energy in the United States? Yes, it is. I like Texas. I do. I go there quite often. I have lots of, actually, this little flash drive was given to me by public citizen of Texas. <laughs> so I, I'm reusing it. Uh, compressed air energy storage. They have one uh, uh, project that they are starting up in Palestine, Texas, that is due to go online in 2016. Well, you pump air into a cavern. You use, when you have excess wind energy that nobody wants, you pump, 
you pump uh, it into an underground cavern. Now, this is known technology in the electricity sector and also known technology in the natural gas sector because you may, you may or may not know a lot of our natural gas is stored in underground caverns, you know, because you can only put so much in the pipeline and use goes up and down. And so in order to accommodate the ups and downs of uses in natural gas, uh, you have storage caverns. So you can pump it at the efficient rate from the wells and then pump it and then withdraw it or store it depending on the demand. And so you do the same with air. Then when you pump it out, you have a heater. You heat up the air. And some people are even trying to recover the heat that you get from compressing the air and putting it in the cavern. And then you generate electricity through a normal gas turbine and you put it in the grid. So you get what is called base load wind. Where is my base load? My charts are not in order. So this is the National Renewable Energy chart. So I'm Indian, so you have to settle for some nonlinear. Uh, uh, so this is base load wind. So this, 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 this yellow, these yellow parts are where you're generating from storage. And these orange parts where you have excess that you're putting into storage. And these green parts is because we don't have a smart grid and where we're waste, where we have too much wind energy and we're wasting it, spilled wind energy. Okay. I'll talk about spilled energy in a little moment. So that's, com so that's one storage method. Another storage method is, you know, so, so this is, this is an excellent nuclear, nuclear system. So the nuclear reactor is up there. It's free. It's a thermonuclear reactor, safely 93 million miles away. And it's using technology that was actually made for a fission nuclear reactor at, at Oak Ridge in the 60s, um, for a thorium reactor, actually, molten salt reactor. And so you, you are storing heat in a molten salt, and then you extract heat from it. So this is a thermal generation system. But you can actually, if you do the power towers, this, this type of storage, you can actually store at high enough temperature that you don't need cooling water and you can still get reasonable thermal efficiency. So you only need to clean your, clean your solar panels, and solar mirrors. I only have 10 minutes left? Okay. Q &A. Huh? Until Q&A. Until Q &A. Okay. So this is one way to do storage. This is, so you can store wind energy. Did you know you can store wind energy in frozen meat? Here's what somebody thought of thought off in Holland, I think. So we, you know, there, there are commercial food freezers. So the food is stored at a certain temperature. I don't know what it is in Fahrenheit, probably, you know, minus 10 Celsius or something uh, below the freezing point of water. Well, when you have surplus wind, what if you store it at minus 11 or minus 12? So you can lower the temperature of your frozen meat or frozen peas if you're a vegetarian. And then when you don't have enough wind, you can just turn off your uh, cold storage compressor because you don't, and let the temperature rise back to the normal cold storage. Of course, you have to make sure you're not destroying your meat and your peas in terms of the flavor and consistency. So there's a little bit of food research to be done in this storage system. But this, this is more straightforward cold storage, is with this air conditioner, which is now commercially available from a company called Ice Energy. This is courtesy of Ice Energy. I have no commercial interest in Ice Energy. And you make ice when the wind is blowing. Uh, and then, see this is a house uh, in Sacramento, an efficient house with a solar panel. So this is its normal, this is its, uh, this, this, this blue, light blue line is the normal demand on the hot summer day in Sacramento. And then this is the modeled, if it had ice storage, you see the peak demand just goes away. So you store ice whenever the energy is available, and then at the peak of the day, you get air conditioning from the stored ice. So you can store energy in, you can store energy in your hot water heater by making a little bit of hot, hotter, you can store energy in uh, heat in bricks for the winter, so you have 
if you have electric heating. There are, there are many, many ways to store energy that we already know. Many of them are quite economical. Today, in the United States, mostly we don't need to store renewable energy because we don't have enough of it, and the existing sort of hydropower and natural gas systems can manage this. Now, this company is not doing that well, but the batteries under that hood are quite interesting because they can charge and discharge a lot more times than what you will need over the life of a typical car, so you can use it together with the grid. And when we have, I say when, we have an electric car system, going from, going from um, a fossil fuel centralized system to a dis decentralized distributed grid will become fairly simple because most of the cars are parked most of the time. In fact, we only use about 5% cars about 5% of the time. And so when you go to the airport, when I, actually at National Airport, I did see a Nissan Leaf plugged in over there. They have electric station where you can plug in your car. Now that car is going to be charged up pretty soon before the person comes back. And then National Airport could make a deal with a grid operator and that can charge and discharge that battery according to the needs of the grid. We have all this technology. In order to make, we're not that far from, from economical, sensible electric cars. Batteries are about a factor of two more expensive, and they are about the energy density, the amount of energy you can store in the battery needs to go up by a factor of two. So together between cost and performance, we're about a factor of four away from uh, the gasoline car. So I think gasoline cars will become uh, obsolete in the same way that stones became obsolete. We'll have plenty of gasoline, we have plenty of stones, but we're no longer in the Stone Age. Okay, so this is your midlife crisis, also an electric car. Tesla now produces sedans for the high end. Uh, this actually performs better than a Lamborghini and was only 40% of the cost. So if you have about 100K, to, you know, you can get this. I, I think they're not, no longer pr producing it. You probably get a used one. Okay, these are sodium sulfur batteries. They cost about twice as much for efficient economical storage as they should. Well, twice as much as compressed air energy storage. But then you don't need a cavern. Uh, this is uh, sodium sulfur storage at a wind, wind uh, uh, farm in Japan. Uh, so this Japanese technology, we're beginning to use it in the United States uh, on a pilot scale. So I've already shown you that. This is the technical chart that corresponds to base load wind. This is how the thermodynamics of it will work. So we put it all together in two studies we've done, and we're starting a third, which will be more advanced and detailed and will have more milestones. But, you know, in carbon-free, nuclear-free, I kind of gave an overall roadmap and a concept and a cost estimate. And then people said, well, you haven't shown every hour of the year, 8,760 hours, what happens when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, all that. How much storage do you need? How much will it cost, et cetera, et cetera. So we did a renewable Utah study and a renewable Minnesota study in which we modeled. This is just one month, but we did this for every month. We got actual utility data for demand. How much are people using in the main utility in Minnesota and Utah? Not in the same study, different studies. And then we got actual renewable energy data from the National Renewable Energy Lab. We downloaded it. We got the solar energy data. We got the wind energy data. So all this the yellow solar generation is a summer wheat and the blue, I think, is wind generation. And so you can see this is the black line is the demand. That's how it goes over the course of a week. You know, daytime, nighttime, daytime, nighttime, and so on. And this is your air conditioning and evening peak. You know, when you all come home, you know, air, air, air conditioning, and then turn on the lights and the TV and start cooking and all that. And when you have surplus, you store, and this green is generation from storage. So one very interesting thing you can see is you can have very low renewable at night, so 
daytime is not necessarily when you run into a peak problem when you have a renewable system. You could run into it at night because you have no sun and you have very little wind and suddenly you want, you're emptying out your storage. And you can see actually it happens at night more often in the summer than in the daytime. And so you're storing energy. This is a winter, this is a winter week in Utah. That was a summer week in Minnesota, so I'm showing you pieces of our two studies. But we showed it can be done. We calculated the amount of storage that would be needed. These are 100% renewable, well, a small supplement of natural gas that could easily be biogas. So this is a kind of a, then we figured out where a smart grid would fit in. So this is kind of a brute force uh, renewable system that you have enough renewables and enough storage to accommodate all demand at every time. How many of you know when the defrost cycle in your refrigerator comes on? I don't know. It would be a really smart person if you knew, a well-instrumented fridge. So, okay, so nobody knows. Do you care? Okay. So suppose the defrost cycle in your refrigerator came on when we had an excess of wind, or you set your dishwasher so their dishwasher came on, unless you were right after a party and you had really a lot of dishes. The dishwasher came on when there was an excess of renewable energy and your storage was full. Or your clothes washing mach machine. And you had a smarter sort of thermostat and that could adjust one degree up and down instead of all completely on or completely off. You could make a much cheaper system. So if you have, do a brute force system, you see there's a very large part of your system, about 20 plus percent, that you're only using for 77 hours in the year, less than 1% of the time, very expensive. And another large part that you're only using, you know, 225 hours in the year, um, about 3% mm, of the time, something like that. So you see, that's the cost of the most expensive. What we use at home is $100, $100 a megawatt hour. So 50 times more expensive, that last piece. We can get rid of that by simply lending our defrost cycle and most of our clothes washing by going to a smart grid. Now, are there privacy concerns with a smart grid? Yes, sort of. Uh, if you care that the utility knows when your defrost cycle is going, um, I would recommend that we have, or you might care more if they know when you turn on your dishwasher or not. Uh, we can have demand aggregator to obscure when people's dishwashers come on. We know how to do this. All the technologies here, Hurricane Sandy, has shown us, I will close with this one example. You know, on March 11th, before the nuclear disaster, there was a tsunami. And the tsunami actually caused an enormous, enormous amount of damage. It wiped out the port of Sendai, which was the closest large city to the earthquake, which was offshore. And it wiped out the transmission and this infrastructure the electrical infrastructure in the port, and of course, everything went dark, even that, the parts that weren't flooded, except for one place. The Tohoku Fukushi University did not go dark. The Tohoku Fukushi University had a microgrid consisting of a natural gas generator, solar photovoltaics, and storage that was operating with the grid in normal times, and then when the tsunami came, it disconnected itself from the grid and the essentials, the elevators, the lighting, the ho there was a hospital and nursing facility, the nursing laboratory, the essential equipment kept operating. Can you imagine how different the situation in South Manhattan would have been if we had microgrids? How much less disruption there would have been if we had, we know how to do this. Tomorrow you will hear that the Germans have become the can-do country. They're doing it. Do we have the guts? So what is lacking is not the technology. 
what is lacking is not whether it's economically feasible because with climate we're, we're spending more and more money to protect ourselves from emergencies. The bill in New York and New Jersey is going to be very high and that will have to be done all along the Atlantic coast and all along the Gulf Coast. It's going to have to be done, otherwise we're going to have this more, most likely every few years we're going to see one of these things. We're having hundred year storms every few years. And it's, it's, I showed you that Arctic ice melt chart. Maybe I should say one thing more about why that chart is important. The sea level isn't going to rise because the Arctic ice is melting. It's just floating ice in the, in the ocean. But the ocean becomes hotter and Greenland becomes hotter. So that whole area is going to become hot, hotter. The Arctic area is getting warmer much, much faster than the average of the planet. And the Greenland ice is the important part. I understand there's a film about chasing ice. I haven't seen it yet, uh, but I'm going to. That's the part we have to worry about and lots of other things that, that, that were kind of beginning to assess. Nobody thought about the disruption of families as a result of a nuclear accident, but now we have to think about that. Similarly about climate, we're going to have to protect ourselves. Microgrids, smart grid, renewables can protect us against catastrophe, minimize the damage, but can also help minimize those things because we're also getting rid of carbon dioxide pollution at the same time. I think what is going on in, in, in the country right now with, the, with, with people who are for the environment and, and for more economic and social and environmental justice insisting that we not have uh, an un, a socially, economically, and environmentally unjust system, at least in a minimal way that we should we should rectify the problems accumulated in the last 30 years. I think we can bring that same kind of force to give, I told you, states are first, people are first, even corporations many times, not all, but many corporations are ahead of Washington. The Pentagon is ahead of most of Washington because they know they're wasting lives and treasure by transporting oil to battlefields. We need to get some real guts and spine into energy policy in this country. Five years after my book was finished, I thought at the time that it would take us 40 years to get it done. I think if we really had the guts, we can do it in 25 years. We can have a completely renewable energy system that will be more reliable, and I'm saying this today, I didn't say it then, than the current system, more resilient to disaster, uh, and certainly more environmentally friendly and more responsible to our children. Let me close in, in Chicago where the first nuclear reaction happened. Let me close with a personal thought. I've often said, you know, that I don't think I would have had more moral wisdom than Einstein were I here in 1939. You know, Einstein wrote the letter to Roosevelt, or signed the letter to Roosevelt that started the whole thing going. But I have also said that I would have, I hope that I would have had the moral courage that Joe Rotblatt had in December 1944, when it was clear the Germans didn't have an effective bomb project, and he said, my job is done. That was before the first plutonium was separated. Before the first plutonium was separated. The chain reaction had happened here, but the first plutonium had not yet been separated at Hanford. There were microscopic amounts for experimentation that had happened you know, out of Oak Ridge and so on. But no bomb project plutonium had been separated in early, by early December 1944. That's when this enterprise should have stopped. You know, some people in, in this university, to their credit, actually did try to prevent the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But I think when I have Einstein eventually reflecting on it said it was the biggest mistake in his life, uh, writing that, signing that letter, uh, Leo Zillard also, I think, regretted it, the inventor of the concept of the chain reaction. You know, it's, the Manhattan Project is often put forward as a project of brilliance. You know, if you have a problem in society, people often say, we should have a Manhattan Project for energy. 
I'm not so hot for Manhattan Project. We've already seen that, been there, done. Brilliance is not enough. So the big lesson of the nuclear age is brilliance without a moral anchor can be a very big problem, a bigger problem than no brilliance at all. Thank you. Thank you, Arjun. Ar Arjun, can you stick around? Okay. Ar Arjun, uh, could we do some Q&A? I have was trying to escape, no. 15 minutes and 22 seconds for Q&A. So uh, make it a question and Arjun will respond. And then we get a few more announcements after that. I want to know if you are aware that the, there is a, a controversy as to whether the containment vessel cracked because of the earthquake or because of the tsunami. And there are a lot of people who say that the, that, that the um, Fukushima cracked because of the earthquake and they say they saw it and they heard it uh, and I just wanted to bring that up uh, and ask you if you had heard this theory. Well, I, I, I haven't heard about the cracks, but I, from the beginning I have been very skeptical of the official theory that the tsunami caused the whole thing. I think it, there's evidence from very early times like the problems in the turbine buildings that um, the earthquake likely caused some damage that was compounded. The trigger for the failure of the electrical systems and the emergency generators was the flooding of the emergency generators. But uh, I think it's very likely that some of the mm, sort of un ground for the problems was laid by, by damage during the earthquake. I don't know that for a fact. There's some speculation in it. I think a lot still needs to be sorted out about the Fukushima accident. Um, and I certainly, you know, I haven't been following it uh, in blow by blow in terms of the technical details for, for some time. So, so I'm not current with everything. But, but certainly I would broadly agree that it was a problem, combination problem, not a tsunami problem alone, most likely. Uh, yeah, thank you for being here. Um, you mentioned that you have seen some maybe movement in, in uh, the opinion about what we should be doing, some awareness, some shifts. And I'm wondering if you are in, um, <clears throat> in contact with some of our uh, legislators or other uh, you know, leaders in the country, and if you could perhaps specify uh, what people might be allies in this, particularly legislators, or if you perceive any kind of larger shift within the population around this issue? Well, I, I don't know that there's a larger shift in the population. Maybe after Sandy there might be, but you know, overall the last few years have seen a kind of a regression in this country on public opinion on climate overall, uh, with many exceptions. You know, I. We, after, after Carbon Free, Nuclear Free came out, many people said, you know, Arjun, you should stop. I'm a serial book writer. And so people said, don't write another book. Please make this happen. You know, you should. So, you know, nonprofits are allowed to lobby some. And so we registered for that. We filed our IRS papers. I tried to, you know, make my two cents worth heard in Washington. But I have to say we failed pretty miserably. Um, Actually, Congressman Kucinich adopted carbon-free, nuclear-free as his slogan during the 2008 campaign. Uh, but, uh, you know, he didn't get a lot of votes and we didn't either. So, <laughs> so but it, we were heard and I really admire his courage for, for doing it. And very often, you know, my philosophy of elections to some extent is that you should put the issues on the table and I really admire the congressman for doing that, but we didn't succeed in Washington. And we stopped. I felt I don't have anything to offer Washington by going to the Hill, because I have no votes, no membership, and I have no money. So <laughs> that is the currency, so to speak. And um, we work at the state level. California is going to lead the way in this country. It is leading the way with its 30, 30 33% renewable energy standard. 
efficiency standards, building standards. It's not that we didn't have initiatives at the federal level. I mean, the Waxman-Markey bill has excellent building standards in it. We just adopted that piece of the Waxman-Markey bill for federal, but we can't. So some things have happened at the federal level that are very good, you know. I, I, um, uh, our EPA administrator, Lisa Jackson, is a very gutsy and courageous woman who cares a lot about the environment. She's done some very good things. But we're out of our depth in Washington. We've been working at the state level with many of you, and we've helped make the nuclear moratoria stick in several states here, Wisconsin, Minnesota. We've worked, helped the work against construction work in progress in Iowa, and so on and so on. We also have helped stop nuclear licensing, at least temporarily, <laughs> around the country through the Waste Confidence Rule. I'll talk about that tomorrow. But um, I would say work hard. Take that chart I showed you to heart, where it shows the states are in the leadership. Organize really strongly at the state level. You know, there are states that have only half a million. The same reason why they didn't they didn't go to South Dakota because it doesn't have a million people, can be a strength. You can, you can organize there pretty strongly, and I think we should do things like that. Uh, I can't, I don't have a, a, a complete political answer for you, but, but indications. Thank you. Hi. Um, Rolling Stone magazine article about Obama right before the election said he wants to make his mark with a smart grid, like the Eisenhower highway system. So maybe we have a springboard there. Yeah. I'm a big student of carbon-free, nuclear-free. I'm from Georgia where we're building Vogel and it's our best hope. I want to tell you that over at that table we have free, no nukes, no coal, no fracking way stickers and a neat little brochure that summarizes some of the awesome points in Arjun's um, yeah. um, presentation. And my question is, and it may really not be up your alley, but it seems to me that the economy is totally a barrier to this, that our heavy infrastructure for extraction of fuel is a driver and is against free fuel from the sun and wind. And if you have thought of this or thought of any way to break through that, well, you know, the initial way to break through that was, you know, carbon taxes or cap and trade system or some, some way to, to mm, channel the investment money into renewable energy and efficiency. Obviously, we don't have that at the federal level. I think the next best thing uh, is to have, not the next best thing necessarily, but but a, a very important thing is to have renewable portfolio standards. So if you fight for a renewable portfolio standard at your state that you fight to actually implement and not set aside, and that makes some sense. I know it's tough in Georgia, but uh, it's tough in Utah. It's tough in some places, but there are states that do have that. And then what happens automatically because you have a renewable portfolio standard is that there will be, what is happening in California right now is that there is an enormous amount of investment in renewables, and that brings down the per unit cost of renewables, and the Germans had led the way into that. You'll hear about that tomorrow. It's a very, very spectacular story. So basically, what that does is you're compensating for the lack of an overall more coherent national policy by state policies and maybe local policies, you know, pressure on corporations, how you buy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and maybe you can gather enough force that, you know, you'd, lots of universities have uh, uh, commitments for renewable energy and efficiency. And many of them are fulfilling them, many of them are not. To actually get it done, what we need is the volume of effort. You know, you, this place should have a smart grid for the University of Chicago. I know uh, the, uh, the University of Illinois at Urbana, I think, has a smart grid. I don't know why. Well, it might clean up the efficiency first, you know, but the, 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 the smart grid could be done in the middle of Chicago. It would be very helpful. So I think that, that's a little piece of carbon-free, nuclear-free origami that I recommend to you that Glenn invented.
uh, renewable portfolio, when you mandate that a certain amount of your electricity should come from renewable sources by a certain date? We've entered the rapid round of one minute questions and one minute answers. Okay. I'm Stephen Sondheim. Hi, Arjun. I'm from the Sierra Club's Nuclear Free Campaign. And I have the same question I always ask you, but it's a little different. I'm, I'm looking now at the notion of taking the money that's being spent on nuclear, both new and maintaining and fixing old, and putting it directly into renewables. And could you give us a sense of a cost comparison? I've heard that we could do all, all the renewable we want in 20 years with that same money. Well, I, I gave you a cost comparison on one of my slides. Wind is already cheaper even with storage. Uh, solar on a large scale is getting there. Solar on an intermediate scale, I think, is less risky and comparable to the middle of the nuclear costs, unsubsidized. Um, so I think, I think we're already there. The, the problem is that the money that is going into nuclear is not in your pocket or my pocket. You know, it is, it is, it is mandated to go to the nuclear industry from, by construction work in progress in South Carolina and Florida. Uh, and, and in, in Georgia, and, and these companies are collecting public money by force of law. It's really, it's really much worse than a tax, even though they are supposedly anti-tax political environments, um, because it's very unaccountable, they don't have to finish. So the trouble is that it's not yours or mine to redirect that money, and so that's why we go ways like renewable portfolio standard and so on. Well, you know, this is not my area of study, so I'll give you my best take on it. First of all, it's very different than the kind of radiation that we've been talking about because it's non-ionizing radiation. It doesn't split apart your DNA molecules or something doesn't get into your body and replace a non-radioactive hydrogen with a radioactive tritium and so on. That's not the way it causes damage. Um, the, you know, there is possibly a risk from various parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. It would appear to be small if it is there. I think um, the spectrum of smart meters is similar, to the best of my knowledge, from cell phones. Uh, there are some, there's at least one study that indicates that holding the cell phone against your ear it causes a small increase in brain tumor risk, uh, but only on that side of the brain. So that can help us sort out, that can help us sort out this mystery. So your smart meter is maybe 20 or 30 feet away, and by the time the radiation from, so all, all of them have to communicate with microwave towers. And so they, the signal strength, I haven't looked at the signal strength of smart meters, but probably very similar. So I think by my rough back of the envelope calculation, the radiation that reaches you inside your house, typically from your smart meter, is a very, very tiny fraction that reaches you from your cell phone in your pocket. And certainly a very small, which is a very small fraction of what reaches you when your cell phone is against your ear because it goes down as one, of the, one over the square of the distance. So if, if you're one inch away um, and the radiation is one, if you're a foot away, the radiation will be one, uh, less than 1% of that, 1.07%. My math, quick math is correct. And so if you're 20 feet away, it's a very, very tiny fraction. So I think there's just like this pollution from solar panel manufacturing this pollution from wind turbine manufacture. There's no clean way other than learning to switch off, other than changing our habits, consuming less and living more frugally, to actually reduce the footprint, our footprint, without creating another footprint that we hope is smaller. Uh, that said, I think we're implementing, so whatever the risk of smart meters may be, and I'm not well studied in it, that's the caveat. I think it is small compared to cell phones. And both of them have some benefit for us. Um, if you have non-microwave smart meters, they also will carry some risk because you have to find some other way of communicating that signal. You have a cable, you have fiber optic cable, you know, 
You have some, you have some stuff that we need a communication system in our electricity system. We need our electricity system to become much more like the phone system that we have now rather than the Ma Bell landline system that we had. So the grid that we have now is sort of like the Ma Bell landline system, very centralized, very. It's reliable, but it works, but it's punch card IBM machines. We need something more like the smartphone system in which you have a communication system between the consumer and the producer, between the substation and the producer. So when something a tree falls somewhere, that the utility automatically knows where it falls, and so on and so on. We need, that's what a smart system means, uh, among other things. Thank you. Okay. Two very quick questions, because uh, we have a number of announcements, and then we've got a break, and we've got to be back early. So quick questions. Um, my name is Bob Johnson. Um, I, I, I'm a professor at Michigan Tech University, but uh, not in engineering. Um, I, I teach rhetoric, so I like to play with words. Um, and what I, I'm interested in education, and I'm, I'm, you began some about you know how we're starting to do some power plants, you know, nuclear plants in South Texas and in, 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 uh, in Georgia. Um, and and I, I've just finished, I've just published a book, which this is unabashedly self um, promotional and uh, called Romancing the Atom and and in and in the book I have a chapter on um, uh, the, the political nature of nuclear power now and the thing that was amazing for me is the easiest chapter to write because what I wanted to go after was a phrase which was um, that were that were co2 free that nuclear does not create co2 and of course that's a lie I mean it's a huge lie and um, but when I went to look at the politicians and some of the powerful people in the country who are making the decisions and driving the decisions to, to fund and come up with the subsidies to create nuclear power plants, it was the easiest chapter of the book to write because I went after quotes that they had and they all said it doesn't emit CO2. And this is everybody from Barack Obama to Lamar Alexander to, to Stuart Brand to you know Bill McKibben. I mean, it's just amazing. So, my question is, how do we educate these very smart people who have already gotten somewhere in their lives? Well, we need to get the facts right ourselves. Uh, you know, as I told you during my talk, there's no zero CO2 source. But there are many sources that are clo much closer to zero than coal or oil. So the numbers are coal is 1,000 grams per kilowatt hour, 900, give or take. Natural gas combined cycle is 350. Better if you have a really new plant. Um, solar, depending on where you install the solar and how you've made your panel and how efficient your cells, solar cells are, maybe 30, 40, 50, 100, 150, could be up there, but always a lot less. And with the promise that if you get rid of the, if everything is run by solar panels, you have no CO2. Wind is also in the 30, 40 gram per kilowatt hour range. That's because we make the steel with coal. If you don't make the steel with coal, it'll be zero. Nuclear is the same. If you don't make the steel and cement with coal, it'll be zero. So nuclear is a low CO2 source, just like solar and wind. It can be a zero CO2 source. CO2 is not the only problem. That's why I showed you that slide. Making plutonium just to boil water does. So you're replacing a carbon problem with a proliferation problem, and you're spending a lot of dollars doing it when you can do the same thing much cheaper. So I, it's, it's part of my kind of burden to, to give this message that, that saying what you said is a little bit more wrong than what Obama might have said. I think when they say zero, they mean close to zero. They may not mean it, but I, I, I'm willing to overlook that because it's more true than not. And um, even though you know, I have been a vigorous advocate of getting rid of nuclear power since before we had too many reactors. I've been doing this for more than 40 years. Bring us home. Linda. Hi, Arjun. Hi, Linda. I, I've heard you speak before and, uh, about this, but I, I wanted to hear you speak toward this point now. Along with the last person who asked, you talked about getting rid of fire. Yeah. Okay. You could, yeah. 
<laughs> this comes from a, a, a guy who was hired by Austin Energy to think. Just a wonderful job. And I had lunch with him once. And he said, you know, bolder than a renewable vision is to get rid of fire. So that means we'd not have biofuels, you know. So fire is supposed to have defined, you know, how we all became human beings and, you know, civilized ultimately and so on. But it's not a very good, so we have solar photovoltaics or solar thermal, you're getting energy, no fire. And because fire is responsible for a lot of, the, doing it with fire is responsible for using a lot of water, a lot of thermal pollution, a lot of fires, of course, <laughs> and fires that you don't want. Uh, and a lot of the air pollution, a lot of the water pollution, so it's air pollution especially. So if you have biofuels, if you have biodiesel in your car, you're still creating air pollution with that. You know, you're creating some particulates, you're creating some carbon monoxide, you're creating some unburned hydrocarbons in your house when you use natural gas for cooking uh, or heating. So getting rid of fire actually, I haven't written about this, but I think it's a brilliant concept for the energy system of the future, together with the distributed grid. Uh, so all of these pieces that I've talked about really fit into a larger, but it's a more visionary concept, and we're trying to aim for the next 25 years, and we can't get people to listen, so I don't by myself talk about it too much. Thank you, Linda, for pushing me, and for that being the last question. Thank so. you, Arjun. Thank you, Kylie.